Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk here today a bit about higher education and digitization and challenges there. And my remarks actually will not be a surprise given what you just heard. This is actually quite interesting. We did not coordinate ahead of time, but there's a lot here that's tied together. So um, Kaplan is a really interesting vantage point from which to look at higher education because Kaplan, as a worldwide education provider, we teach students who are trying to get into college. We also teach students who are in college and provide degrees for them. But we also work in the workplace. We do workplace training as well. So we actually get to see the, the whole sweep of education all the way across. Um, and one of the things that when you think about the digital transformation of higher education, you really can't start there. You actually have to start with a topic that's coming up perhaps more tomorrow, which is the digital transformation of work to begin with. What is it that we need our folks to be able to decide and do? And here, the fundamental technology transformations are profound. Everyone, whether they are high status or low status in terms of their careers, are now going to be working alongside information-rich appliances. Well, those appliances change at the rate of Moore's law, and therefore, what the people need to do alongside them to work as best they can is all of a sudden going to have to start changing at the pace of Moore's law. That means you can no longer become a master of something in your 20s and coast, as I do, until my 50s, right? You actually have to change what you're doing because the, the, the tools are changing, your job may actually disappear, and therefore it means um, uh, we really have to think hard about how are we going to have lifelong changes. So that's either a threat if you think about traditional higher education as being only about early training and then stand away, or it's a serious opportunity where higher education can become masters of understanding, well, what is going on with careers? What is happening to skills, pulling that back into the institution and becoming a trusted lifelong partner for careers? As opposed to some institutions whose lifelong relationship is around donations, not around the new skills that you need. Well, what's needed if this is going to happen in higher education? Well, several things, one is, as we just started to hear a little bit, learner success, especially after they leave programs and courses, has got to be much more at the center of the academy. Somehow has to become central. And that means things like more investments in understanding uh, what actually do successful learners do after they leave? What are top performing jobs like? What do people decide and do? That has to come back into the academy. It can't be lost or ignored. It also means there really has to be much better performance-based approaches to gathering evidence about whether our learners are actually achieving what they need to be able to decide and do to become successful after they leave. So it's not enough to get a 95% on a multiple choice quiz at the end of my course. I need to have a performance and ability to decide and do things that matches where I'm trying to get to later on. It also means uh, more evidence-based practice and feedback tied in with uh, the learning environments so that you really start to have a reason for why you teach or why you create practice the way you do. And that also ties into much faster, more iterative approaches to running your learning environments, to gathering data, to changing them quickly, as we were just hearing, having a whole team of people, a whole department take ownership of this and essentially take ownership of the success of their learners long after they leave the department's uh, uh, own boundaries. In addition to all of what I just described there, which is more cognitive, the other thing that has to be more central to a university is understanding what is it that gets in the way of learners at all stages of their lives, preventing them from starting, persisting, or putting in mental effort into these key evidence-based learning activities that we will all have to do to actually stay valuable over time. There's a whole realm of motivation science that needs to be at the core of this. So if you think about all that, there's a lot there. So to get at this, what I would argue is higher education really needs to think about possibly more dedicated, maybe even full-time, esteemed resources that actually have a focus on following learners throughout their work and not just 
people who want to become researchers, like the faculty, but wherever they go, following them out beyond the university and pulling that back in, and then departments and universities really advising on how competencies are actually changing, in addition to even offering advice on, well, what are the next careers and jobs that your competencies are now best suited for, given that something you were trained for is going away? Well, what's next for you? And it may not be where you thought it was. You thought you were a business person. You may end up actually being a great project manager with just a little bit of additional work, even if you didn't think that that was what was going to happen to you. So, we, you know, if we can get this done, it will make higher education become that reliable life partner at all ages to help each of us establish a successful plan for our inevitable career changes. Now, you'll notice, I don't think I mentioned technology at all in that. And that's because technology just takes learning solutions and makes them more affordable, more reliable, more available, more data rich, more personalized. But technology will do that for a bad learning solution, just as it will do it for a great learning solution. Imagine your worst ever college professor, now able to damage the hopes and dreams of millions of students worldwide, thanks to the glories of MOOCs and YouTube, right? Win for technology? I don't think so, right? So you've got to come up with the learning solutions, the work solutions, and then you turn to technology and say, how can technology help us implement that? So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please take a seat. Ah, <laughs> Professor Ndemo, we found him. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. So, welcome from my part. My name is Jens Peter Gaul. I'm Secretary General of the German Rectors Conference, and I have the honor and the pleasure to chair this panel tonight about the digital transformation of higher education. Just be polite and say hello. If you compare the, the original booklet for this um, panel with um, what you see now on the, on the screen, um, Professor Kasper Hene from our big university in Göttingen unfortunately wasn't able to make it to this panel, but we'll try to, to cope as best as we can. Thanks a lot. Okay, bro, thanks a lot for your, for your really um, stimulating remarks in the beginning. Before we start, just uh, very, very few words to, uh, regarding our panelists, uh, just one or two sentences uh, concerning their background. You've already got to know uh, Bro, and so I'll go on with Professor Hesse here, um, on the left beside me. He's spokesperson of the and, and founding director of the Leibniz Education Research Network, and also vice president of the Leibniz Association, one of the four big research associations in Germany. And by training, he's a psychologist, so we'll, he'll get the background behind all of your questions. Keep that in mind. <laughs> to my left, we have my esteemed colleague, Dr. Ruland, Secretary General of the German Academic Exchange Service, the DRAD. You're quite familiar with that. Amongst other things, she has been previously director at the Center for International Cooperation at the Freie University in Berlin. And um, looking at her training, she has a training in literature, history, and musicology. Frankly, Dorothea, I didn't know that we have to talk about music sometime. You yeah. Born in Karlsruhe, yeah. yeah, I was born in Karlsruhe. You too? I'm not, I haven't been born there, but I stayed in Karlsruhe okay. for many, many years. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, yeah, homies, homies, you see. Okay, great. <laughs> so, and uh, welcome, Professor Ndemo. Once again, um, he is Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship at the University of Nairobi's Business School. And amongst other things, he is former par um, Permanent Secretary at Kenya's Ministry of Information, Communication and Technology. And his background is um, he has a degree in finance and a PhD in industrial economics uh, from the University of Sheffield. So welcome, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us here. Um, as um, 
Professor uh, Kasper Hene couldn't make it, um, I'll try to uh, replace her, quote unquote, uh, from the perspective of the German universities, which maybe has a tendency to be a bit more conservative perspective, but we'll see how it turns out uh, over the panel. My basic idea would be then to um, uh, have each and every panelist uh, to have a very short statement uh, about his key perspective on the issue, and then try to uh, enter into a discussion here on the panel and then open it up with throwing microphones and uh, the pigeonhole technology to all of your questions. So, thanks a lot. Um, Bro, we heard, your, we heard your basic statement, so I'll leave you out and ask Professor Ndemo for his key messages. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you wouldn't hear. Um, just a week ago, we were in Canada and uh, we were discussing future of work. And the questions we were asking were, what kind of skills that we teach today for the future work? Um, more problems in global south because 85% of the current jobs would be wiped out with technology as it becomes cheaper. Even investors in developing countries will begin to invest in uh, automation. But I'm saying this because um, in Africa we have had a lot of problems um, trying to convince universities to, to add courses that would make students more employable. And what happens is that uh, many students cannot, as it was said from Finland, that uh, you can't have students go to work um, it becomes very expensive. That's a problem we are undergoing at the moment. And what has happened in, in between is that several schools have mushrooms, uh, mushroomed to do the finishing job with, which the university is supposed to be doing. That's one. But in the meantime, um, a lot of young people go onto YouTube to actually, some of them learn code by themselves and they begin to do um, a lot of work. Um, what I've discovered in, in, as a policy maker now teaching is that if you provide all the resources, if you provide connectivity, if you provide everything, the students actually um, find their way to doing it. The problem is that professors don't want to hear that, well, I used a MOOC, that's how I'm asking this question. Uh, they become very harsh, um, either because uh, they don't know, um, maybe we find out what, what is happening in between, uh, but there is a, a real problem that some students actually go ahead of the professors because there is so much available resources. And so what we need to do is um, as we concluded in Canada, is to encourage lifelong learning. I don't know how we can be able to do it. Hopefully we can get ideas from this conference that I can take back to, to Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ndoum. Professor Hesson. I might like uh, to start from Bro's introduction, which I liked a lot, because he was pointing to the fact that we educate people, train people to be ready for the, for the kind of work they do after they leave school, and of course, uh, for their life going on after that in learning or relearning all the time. So what, what we are trying in educating people is of course more I can refer to. In the morning we heard we have to talk about motivation, we have to talk about reliability and other soft skills. And I agree that's important, but I will stay a little bit to the knowledge part, the, not the cognitive part. And what we do is learning to build up knowledge, to build up knowledge to be able to infer about something to make decisions, to solve a problem, to reason about a certain thing in a certain way. So if this is true, 
then there are two big components participating in this process. The one is our system, which is taking all the knowledge, inferring, decision-making, problem-solving, and this is our cognitive systems. And cognitive psychologists know a lot about this system. I will refer to this a little bit later. The other thing is, and I'm, I should not talk about technology in the, in the direct sense, is our information environment, as the environment is just right now. So, at the one end, we could talk about learning without any change in the technical world, in the information environment, and we can train, do better learning, and a lot of these things are referring to this better learning. But at the same time, we are challenged to find out what is probably possible with a change in this information environment. And there are, of course, some changes over the last 10, 15 years in this century, and there are some more recent changes. And the recent changes which are relevant for our learning, for our education, our cognitive systems, is not the bandwidth, it's not the speed of, uh, of information which is going through the net. This is important, of course. I, I, I completely uh, agree that this is helpful. But there are two aspects which are much more relevant for the cognitive point of view, for the learning point of view. And one is the ubiquity of information, and the other way is this new form of interactivity we can have with information we can look for, we, we, which are available, that we can explore things, that we can deal with these things, and something like this. And if this is true, the ubiquity and the new form of interactivity, we might change the metaphor we are following most of the time. And the metaphor we are following most of the time is knowledge has to be brought into your, in, to our head. So most of the learning in connection with this new technical uh, development, and we heard this this morning too a little bit, is more or less uh, yeah, automatized the old form of learning, the analog form of learning to build up knowledge in the head. But if it's true what I said before, then we could look for something which is, could be a new metaphor, which is a division of labor between knowledge in our head and knowledge in digital resources. If these two forms of knowledge come together in a nice way, that, that we really can interact with knowledge, I say knowledge even as a psychologist, I should say information, but anyway, uh, with knowledge in digital resources, there could be an interplay we have to look for to optimize this kind of interplay between knowledge and our head. And if this is a new perspective, a new metaphor, we should change the way we teach, we should change the curriculum, and we should change the way information is set up in the digital resources. Maybe we can come to, back to this later, but this would be the main idea I would like to bring in into the discussion. Thank you, Professor Hessen. <laughs> Dr. Ruland. Yeah, I just gone. We have knowledge all over the world. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I have quite a loud voice, but it's still better. Um, we have knowledge all over the world. I think knowledge will be the currency of the future. So we have to build networks between the different knowledge providers, universities, research institutions. I would like to focus on five dimensions, and I would like to start from the top. Um, if I look at universities, first of all, I would say, if we want to bring together internationalization and digitalization, I would say this is extremely important. So we can build bridges between our different countries, we can distribute our knowledge. Um, we need, it must be a decision by the government of the institute, governance, sorry, governance, not government, government comes later, governance uh, of the different institutions. We do have, in general, strategies for internationalization, and I think we have to bring it together, internationalization and digitalization, on a very strategic level. Otherwise, you have small islands all over the university. This is not very successful. You don't have to invent the wheel again and again. It's very costly and not very far-sighted. 
Then, if you have such a kind of governance, I'm very much convinced that there's a huge added value, lots of potential in learning, teaching, and research. And therefore, now I would go on with the second dimension. This is mobility, including teaching and learning. If you look at student population, you have outgoing students, you have incoming students, and you have students who have decided not to go abroad. And they all have their very specific needs, and many of these needs can be at least not solved, but might be supported by digitalization. And it works all over, I would say, the world already. You can do a lot by preparation of mobility, online testing, assessment tests, and many more other instruments to facilitate mobility and support a successful stay abroad. This is true for the incomings and for the outgoings. Again, online courses or digital examinations might help students to integrate a stay abroad more flexible into their study program at their home university. Virtual mobility, I think, is a very important aspect for the percentage of students in Germany, it's around 40%, who are not interested for different reasons to go abroad. But we are very much convinced they need international exposure. And this can be done by virtual mobilities. And there are many different instruments that could be virtual guest lectures, online teaching in blended learning or flipped classroom formats, many different opportunities. So we need it for the outgoings, we need it for the incomings, and we need it still more for the students who stay at home because we live in a globalized world and people have to start to learn from the scratch how to behave and how to, to handle these issues. And, of course, we need it for internationalization of curricula. That would have been the issue of Frau Kasper-Hene. And, again, you can use similar instruments, guest professors who join in on a virtual base. Um, or when I went to Hong Kong, it was a great experience to learn about cooperations between groups of students in Singapore and in Hong Kong working on the same project. Actually, it was on business something. And in the end, it, I think it's always important, nevertheless, to meet at a certain point. So I would say blended learning is a very good way to go. Third dimension, research. Digital media can supplement, support, and re-establish international cooperations of universities and their partners. Especially since today, we not only concentrate on bilateral cooperation, many more universities started to build up their strategic networks. So quite often, they have several partners, very strategically selected, with whom they want to cooperate. DAD did support such a kind of program. It's called strategic partnerships. Many universities joined in. And because they are cooperating with several partners, in general, something between three, four, five, they have to use a digitalization, otherwise it just will not work. The fourth dimension, marketing, quite common. You know, as I mentioned, we live in a globalized world. We all would like to get bright students from abroad. Germany, vice versa, we are very much interested to send our own students abroad. I think we are doing quite good in this field. But today, you really need digitalization to make it work. You not only have fairs all over the world, you have virtual fairs, you have lots of uh, webinars to introduce new topics, new issues. You can give insights into, in, into countries which are not yet, yet so familiar. So, uh, and MOOCs, of course, are a kind of marketing as well because they present what a certain university is offering. They are part of the reputation of a university. Coming to the fifth, uh, fifth dimension, all this is quite costly. And it will not work hmm. without sustainable funding. Absolutely. This we have to be sure about. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Given that we have 90 minutes, there's almost uh, 
I mean, it's overwhelmingly rich issues. But I tried to make a, a, a direct question back to Dorothea. Um, what, what was quite intriguing uh, to hear you talk about um, virtual mobility, um, because I found it interesting that um, you had a very positive vibe talking about it. Because I th I'm thinking back a few years ago when we had a discussion about virtual mobility on the European Research Framework uh, level discussion. And then there was a decision not to move too much towards virtual mobility. Um, the argument was that um, it shouldn't replace real mobility, but the context you you outlined was um, that we can't go ahead without virtual mobility given the circumstances. It in shouldn't the replace world. real mobility in the end, and this therefore I, men I mentioned uh, blended learning. Yeah, so you can work on a virtual base, but there, you always should meet at a certain mm -hmm. point because the intercultural exposure, meeting people, is extremely important. One point I missed and I would like to add, we live in a world full of crisis. And especially for countries where we can't go anymore or we decide not to go anymore, virtual education is the only option. I still remember half a year ago, DAD was approached by young Syrian students coming from Aleppo. And they asked us, because they were still students at that time in Aleppo and professors, whether we could offer uh, virtual programs. It didn't work out for several reasons in the end, but I think for the future we have to think about this. So there is lots of potential, but it never should replace meeting each other. Thanks for the clarification. Thanks a lot. Um, one, one basic remark um, from, from my side. Um, today is an interesting day, so this, this um, panel and the whole, um, the whole meeting is very timely. There's a high probability that tomorrow um, the German parliament will vote on new copyright law concerning the usability of, um, of materials for research and especially teaching in German universities and uh, research organizations. Um, this is very, very important. Um, the voting is tomorrow at 8.45, um, and it's basically the last thing the parliament does before the legislation period comes to a closure. I guess most of you are aware that we have federal elections coming up in September this year. So it's a very interesting day, um, and uh, this is really um, an, an important step if the parliament decides as planned tomorrow. So we all should keep that in mind that um, there's a much, I mean, Dorothea said the government comes later. That's, that's absolutely right, but it has some important decisions to make, and so this could be a big step. Um, just a short remark from the university uh, perspective, additional remark. Um, the, when, when we think about the digital, digitalization as a fact, then you need digital skills, whatever this means. We can talk about that later. And where do you get them from? And if you look at the German situation today, it's like 55% of a yearly cohort that are going to university. So the university system has the big responsibility um, for uh, the higher edu for the for the overall education uh, in the German system at the moment. And um, if if you keep that in mind that these people are digital natives. Again, the question: What does it mean? I mean, it does not qualify you for digital skills if you're able to like post your salami pizza on Facebook. But um, it's let's say it's a starting point. Um, but it uh, should change the the environment. The, the relatively conservative, or in parts conservative, view of the universities on the digitalization era is combined with some aspects which have already been mentioned here. Um, let's let's call them the transformative costs. One is real cost. Dr. Ruland talked about money, um, to, to have the imagination that um, digitalization would make it cheaper is surely a wrong one. It will cost a lot of money and will, make, um, uh, and will be necessary to have some very, very um, big funding efforts here. And the second point is that we'll have a continuous challenge to filter the useful from the useless. Bro, you, you addressed that. Um, digitalization is not an end in itself, so we have to find what helps and what maybe just produces costs. That's a, that's a third. And the third one, maybe the biggest is, and, and I would turn that into a question to Bro again, um, representing a for-profit organization. Um, from the German university perspective, um, digitalization should not be a vehicle to um, be an attack on 
uh, education as one of the most important public goods in, in our system. So, bro, I would like to ask you, you see a conflict there selling things and um, this idea of being education being free, not in that simple sense, but you know what I mean. So. I, I do know what you mean. Uh, let's see. Hello? This, yeah, yep. Yeah. I, I do know what you mean, and, and it is, uh, it's interesting because education for centuries has been about buying things. I mean, you, you need to buy services to run the university, you, people buy textbooks, it, it costs money to run these things. So the tax status is not so important. But I will say is this, which is, there's a really interesting pressure now on any of us, forget the tax status, but on any of us who actually charge for learning. Because it used to be you had to pay to get a really bad education, right? That, you know, you had to go to college. I mean, you had to pay tuition, even if it was not great. Nowadays, bad education is free. You can go find poorly designed MOOCs and badly designed YouTube videos and all kinds of horrible things online that are still better than nothing. They're just not great, right? So any of us, it doesn't matter, you know, tax status, any of us who are charging for education, we really have to bear down and start thinking, how are we adding value over free, which is increasingly getting better and better, right? And there's lots of ways to do it. One way is, you are focused on better competencies. You, you, as I mentioned, you, you know something about the workplace and how it's changing, so your targets are really the right targets for the future, others are not. So that's one way. Another way is just more efficient. You, you are able to adapt to what a learner already knows and can do, and you can also find the gaps, and so you can make it more efficient for a learner to get to goal, or you can be more reliable, where if you start with us, we can really assure you, you will get to this goal. It may take a lot of effort, but we are good at this, we can get you to this goal. Those are all reasons to be able to continue to charge. So I actually think that's going to become the, the bigger pressure on all of us is staying ahead of the things that are literally free. It's not about for-profit or not-for-profit, it's that. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to um, pose a question to Professor Ndemo. Um, if you look at the screen here, um, I see if I can highlight this question. I'm an analog native, so I might be... Ah, it's wonderful. Um, Professor Demo, the, the question you see on the monitor is, uh, could you comment on the progress in development of digital infrastructure for Kenya and Africa in a, in a broader sense, please? Actually, um, infrastructure is not a problem. Uh, affordability is the problem. Uh, at some point, uh, we never used to have sufficient broadband. We now have across the continent and um, the challenges are in the last mile. Um, some countries have so, sorted out, like Kenya has done, comprehensively sorted out the issue on infrastructure. What I worry about Africa is countries that are worried of online uh, thinking a revolution could emerge from there and uh, block um, the internet. Um, as a way of managing the people. That is the biggest worry in Africa. I, would, I had a discussion with uh, Enesa. Enesa is one of the fastest growing um, uh, digital material in Kenya. Two million users in a very short period of time. Uh, that tells you that the, the hunger to, 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 to get the, the knowledge is there. One thing that I think we need to do a lot of research is that uh, if you look at the adoption of uh, mobile money in uh, my country, initially people thought that, well, it just has a few percentage of people will do it, but now almost 99%, including the illiterate. Uh, it tells you that if there is so much need, um, you don't need to have classes for for people to go learn about something, either in education or something. So if we create the need, like uh, Enesa has done, I think he should wave, I don't know where you are, how he's seated there. Um, if create the content where it is needed most, it spreads. Um, what we need to address Africa is that um, disruptions from fearful governments Thanks a lot. Um, th there's another question here um, on, on, the, on our platform. Um, 
before I highlight it, just a, sh a short remark, and this will be a question to, to Professor Hesse, the skills issue. I mean, um, if, if it's part of university education to um, be able to, to um, build up these digital skills, then this can't be done with analog tools, or not only with analog tools. So you need kind of basic digital literacy to enter into this learning process. And it sounds a bit like a vicious circle. I mean, would it be the right perspective for the university system to look at the school system and say, hey, school, you have to provide the, the people coming to university with a basic uh, digital literacy so we can add on this? Or is it also a genuine um, task which has to be done at university. I see it as a complex issue and there are people asking for it here. Um, if I try to highlight this question, um, if I... Ah, there it is. What key digital competences are necessary for students in higher education independent from their field of study? So this would be one question. The other part maybe would say, what, what do you need to, uh, concerning a digital basic literacy if you enter mm -hmm. university? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess this question is a quite important one, but it's only part of a bigger topic. So, of course, we talk about media literacy, and we talk about something that the content, which is now available, didn't, didn't go to a, to, uh, to a survey, to a critical survey, so you have to do it on your own. So, of course, you need a critical distance to the information. You, can, you need a critical way to understand is this source reliable, is this, can I believe in this knowledge, and so on and so on. So from that point of view, of course, we, we have to train people to find, to, to, to find a way to find the right information and to have a critical view on the information before they get integrated into their knowledge system. But when I said it's only one part of the story, uh, and I refer back to what I said before, then we probably have to find out first what do we do with this information environment? How do we design not only things going on to the learner? Because the learner didn't change that much. We have to, we have to talk about what we have to change in the information environment. Let's look at the learner one second. All the things we do in, in, in the learning process has to go through our working memory. This is a quite limited resource. It was a quite limited resource. It will stay a limited resource. And the amount of information we can process per time unit will be, will be only a few information. And this will not be changing. So if we want to empower our knowledge possibilities, our learning, then we have to change something else. And from an ecological point of view, mankind always was good in adjusting to the environment. And now we have a changing environment, and we can do something to, yeah, to design this environment, this information environment. And if, if it's true that uh, there's a chance to do more by integrating knowledge in your head in knowledge in digital resources, then we have to organize how this knowledge is organized in digital resources. And not only what knowledge is there, but also how it is presented and how, and this probably is the most important one, how it is manageable for me that I can explore the knowledge, that I can deepen the knowledge, that I can interact with the knowledge. And sometimes we even talked about a visual turn. So many of the, or much of the information is not only a written text, is on a visual display available. We have a smartphone, we have a, we have a, a bigger screen, or we have smaller screens, and we interact with this knowledge. And we have to optimize the way how we deal with this external information to make it usable for inference process, for knowledge, uh, for problem solving, for decision making, and things like this. So whenever we only ask for the digital competences of students, it's too short. We have to do more. And when I said before, we have to change even the curricula. So let me give a very, very simple example. 
in probably seven or eight or 10 years ago, you probably knew about 10, 11 phone numbers of your friends. How many do you know still? One or two? And you completely rely on external information which is your smartphone. So there's a division of labor taking place in your everyday life all the time. And, and in the everyday life, this is, this is taking place all the time, but in education, in our system, we are a little bit slow in taking into advantage that, or making advantage of this phenomena which is already on the way. So we should, we should find out what we have to bring into our brain, into our cognitive system. And we definitely still need expertise. We definitely still have to train this aspect of knowledge in your head to be an expert. But we can be better in problem solving, decision making, and things like this if we have additionally this interplay. And going back to Pro's perspective in the beginning, I guess in the industry, if you talk about Industry 4.0, an industry is successful if it is using a lot of this division of labor between a, a digital resource and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the intelligence in digital resource and the human expertise. And, and there could be many examples to show how this is working. So, of course, we have to address the digital competence of students, but if we only would look at that, it's not enough. Thanks a lot, Paul. You would like to comment directly? Yeah, briefly. Uh, uh, Dana Joya, who used to run the National Endowment of Humanities in the US, had a nice way of characterizing the purpose of education, which then drives at what, what uh, Dr. Hess was just saying. He said the purpose of education ought to be to build productive citizens for a free society. So productive citizens has everything to do with much of what I talked about, we were talking about here, what are the skills you need, and you know, I'm of an age where I had to learn to use a slide rule as an engineer. I can tell you I haven't brought out a slide rule in a long time, right? But that was required to be a productive citizen back at the, at the, in the day. But there's this other side of it, which I think underpins maybe some of this question here about digital competencies, which is to be a citizen of a free society today, it's really complicated. You know, you may be a nurse, but you have to decide if it's okay if the government gets access to the information on your iPhone. So this is cryptography, it's privacy, it's a whole range of things. How am I going to learn about that, right? And that's part of what you were just describing as how do you evaluate the evidence and so forth. Or the other side, an IT person is going to have to make some decisions about is it okay to allow germline modifications of the human genome? We could eliminate genetic disorders of certain kinds forever, but it opens the doors to designer babies. Discuss. Well, this is hard, right? So how, you know, the, the competencies are not just raw digital competencies, it's really about solving those kinds of tasks both the work-related tasks, but also the tasks of now being a citizen are gonna draw a lot more on how you can evaluate information that you're getting and that you can find using our tools. Dr. Ruland. Uh, I would like to add one point and I would uh, like to come back what you already mentioned. I think the student body in Germany has changed tremendously. You mentioned 55% of all our young, young people are going to university. And there's a huge diversity. We have a high percentage of foreign students. In general, I would say something like 15%. In technical universities, sometimes much higher. In music schools, sometimes about 50%. You have a huge diversity, students studying with families, you know. Um, and the great thing is, digitalization makes you independent from from time and space, actually. And we just read, I think, two or three days ago from the Studentenwerks that more than 60% of our students are working. So it, had, it has to fit into it. This, I think, is a very important aspect. And it's much more individual. If you do not understand this course in Analysis 1, you can repeat it as often as you like it until you understand it. This is one aspect. Another thing, what we sometimes don't think about, um, it can improve quality tremendously because you can bring in virtual professors from all over the world. They might not come to Berlin because they are far too busy or might not go to Nairobi. But via a module, you can join them into your programs and that might improve quality tremendously. 
<laughs> Thanks a lot. Before we open up to the floor, I would like uh, to, to um, highlight one of these questions here, which I, uh, personally speaking, like very much. I'll show you the question. Um, come on. Okay. <laughs> I like it because I like the antagonism between the uh, university leaders and the presidents, rectors, and the students, which is transported here, shouldn't be the students' way of choosing their own digital study technique, like YouTube study apps, etc. be supported more instead of trying to force it from the university side. Uh, I would like to, uh, to the panel to comment on that, because I think it raises the quality control issue. Bro. So this is so complicated, because it turns out there's research that, especially when novices pick how they're going to learn, they actually don't do very well at it. They often, they have wrong models of how learning works, and so they will prefer to reread a textbook uh, during the same time, instead of reading it once, closing the book, and then trying to actually, you know, write down everything they learned during the one rereading. Well, one of them makes them feel like an idiot, and the other one is very comforting, because I'm rereading the same thing over and over again, but long term, it's the actual production that, that actually causes learning to stick. So there's, at the same time, there really are things about learners and motivation and all that that should lead them to be able to make choices. So there's a tension here that's a necessary tension between you know, guiding among several good choices as opposed to whatever you want to do is fine with us because it's a little bit like medical treatment. If you ask a six-year-old, would you like a needle in your arm this time? The six-year-old will probably say, thank you for asking, but no, I would prefer not to have a needle in my arm. You know, we know we want to make vaccination as simple and easy as possible, but at a certain stage, there, there's, a, there's some fundamental things about how learning works. We should make sure our students end up taking advantage of. Take the needle from the record and put it in my arm. It's a famous quote from a great from a great record. Okay, <laughs> would, would you, uh, Professor, would you like to add a comment on, on that? More or less, I, I, I guess uh, framing it as attention is a good thing, uh, and maybe you put a little bit more more yeah, attention to the one side. I should, of course, add, which is which goes along with attention, that it's good to have as much freedom within a certain framework to get some motivation. Because learning really needs being motivated, being, being ready to take the message, to take the information, and always have in mind this, 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 this notion of AIME, A-I-M-E. Learning only takes place if the amount of invested mental effort is there. If you just read something and you do not put in this this, this mental effort, it will not be in your head, it will not be uh, manageable later on and, and retrievable and something like this. So it's more or less agreeing with the tension which is there. Thanks a lot. I would like to open the discussion now for questions from the physical audience, not from the virtual audience. As a chair, I insist on once throwing this um, microphone. So are there any questions, comments, or remarks you want to make? Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's passiert, it's passiert. So, also, Sie haben was Wichtiges gesagt vorher, was mich bewegt. Build productive citizens for free society. And if I work all over the world and I see the infrastructure having enormous problems and understanding, for instance, the United States not having the kind of infrastructure that actually will support what you said, how do we deal with the data about what it is that we currently consume and how we could make that a better environment by consuming things in a sustainable way? My question because the data is extremely important. So. Thanks. Okay, just keep it. Yeah. Just keep it. Okay. Bro, please. So, okay. he's Thank leaving you. with the Goodbye. <laughs> I'm not sure that. He I'm walks away with it, yeah. Um, so, um, if, if I understood what your question is, I, I think part of it is around, you know, how do we uh, capture and hold data in a way that's really responsible? 
and make it work. So there was a conference in Northern California uh, sponsored by Stanford and, a, and a, a consulting group called Ithaca that had a nice way of talking about it. They, 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 the conference was about the responsible use of data. And the idea was, again, a tension to set up between privacy, which is critical. I mean, we got to do that. But there was also the, the moral argument that says, wait, if, if by having a lot of data, we can actually improve learning for many more learners going forward, we really actually have a bit of a moral obligation to try to use that data too. So I think that there is, there is this back and forth that we all have to think about and that has not been resolved yet about things like how long should data about learning be kept? Who should have access to it? Can it be anonymized sufficiently, but not so much that it's not helpful anymore? And I, I think this is, these are active questions because the data is beginning to now explode. Um, I, I, Professor Hessen. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, maybe I could add the perspective of making use of my learning data. Because what does a good teacher do? A good teacher is quite, uh, yeah, quite strongly looking what a concrete student is doing. And he finds out that he needs support at that point or he probably would profit from a different way of presenting material or doing some explanations. Partly, this could be done by learning analytics. So if we talk about this way of data, analyzing this data and making them available for the student or the students in, in general themselves and the interaction between a potential tutor or teacher and the students, then there could be a great success in doing this. In the beginning of the online learning, we talked about time-independent, place-independent learning, learning on the own speed and, and doing it more fast, less fast, and something like this. And nowadays, we have even this kind of data which can be analyzed and can be made very, very profitable. But of course, this is just an additional comment to what Bra said before, to the privacy of this data, and probably the student has to decide on, on themselves uh, if they want to open it, to what degree they open it, and, and something like that. Thank you very much. Another question here. Now, we we'll see. Oh, oh. <laughs> what a pity. Oh, thanks. Very good. Um. Okay, uh, so many of you talked about the importance of students or the learners doing something themselves. So my question is, how do we actually, in the digital sphere, do we manage to, to create makers instead of students? You know, to actually do something, create something themselves by uh, learning. Um, well, I, I myself, I'm a filmmaker, so I, I'm making things out of context. So uh, I know how to do that. But I, I, I think it, it seems very important if you create these uh, digital learning concepts that you make uh, making available so that people can create something and you need to create concepts of uh, you know, taking care of that. I, I can start and then my colleagues pitch in. I think I understand this. The, the, the question is, how do we increase the amount of making that we get done in higher education? You know, creation of things as opposed to passive listening, as opposed to, you know, filling out worksheets or even maybe stranger writing essays about making, right? You know, writing essays about filmmaking as if that was a filmmaking course. And I think there, the, the key is these learning outcomes. You know, how do you decide, what do you want students to be able to decide and do at the end of this experience or course or program? And very likely in many programs, something that is, something you make, something you write, a, a create, build, is going to be part of that, whether it's a marketing report or whether it is a film piece or whether it's a circuit diagram. And the only way to get there is by actually having practice and feedback built into the course programs with the faculty guiding and coaching where you, you, you need to build. It's not enough to think about or hear about building, you have to do it. So, so that's the trick is then, how do you incent and, and encourage faculty and programs to do more building? And I think that's... 
I, I think I've got a view that uh, we are stuck somewhere during the industrial period where we are even deciding that this is the major engineering major, accounting major. Uh, but if, even if I ask a simple question, how many of you who are doing exactly the major they did in college, um, how many? Um, did I, can I ask the question again? How many of you are exactly doing what they studied in college? <laughs> We're not. The, that is where the problem begins. Today, I know some of the coders who are coding um, perfectly who never went to a computer science school. They have just learned it from other sources. And I think we need a revolution and assume that nobody in his undergraduate who knows what they will do and maybe provide liberal arts education and leave people to do what they can do best in their lives. Um, I get this thinking from Ken Robinson who says we are just boxing people and producing them. They, were, they have graduated and some could be the best scientists if they went to college after 30 but we must make sure that they are through by 23, and then they don't do what, what they really want to do. So I think we need a, dis a disruption. We, universities must begin to think. Either we go multidisciplinarily and see whether we can produce graduates who can uh, be able to do what they love most. I don't know. Yeah, maybe I understood the question to what degree the new environment is making us more active, more creative, and how one can support this. And as we talked about the kind of interactivities, uh, which is not only searching and finding, but is manipulating, exploring, and something like this, I would, I would say there's a strong support for being much, much more active, much more deciding with each step, what to do next, how to do it, in which way to do it, and there is a, probably a tension between becoming active and creative. So from, from that point of view, uh, it, it opens a lot of activity which is close to becoming creative, and if we talk about, as we, we heard before, say, getting connected, getting into communication to someone else, even over over national borders on an international level or from, from different points, there's, there are many, many additional aspects which are making, making my experience richer, self-steered, self self-organized, and from that point of view, it's a great opportunity uh, to make use of this new way of learning or knowledge building compared to a classroom where you have to be one of 25 students waiting for the possibility to get the given answer if the teacher is taking uh, into account that you were raising your heads and something like this. If you compare these two settings, there's a huge amount of additional activity possible. Thanks, and, and it really connects to the genuine idea what studying, I mean, to close the circle, what studying at university means. I mean, um, if um, I recently heard the figures about how many different jobs an average person has during its lifespan. Uh, I mean, it's uh, how do you find a job? But in this, in, this, um, in this study, there was about saying in the United States, it would be around like 8.5 average uh, in the average lifespan. And even in the relatively stable Germany, it has uh, risen to like 3.2 or something like that. So what we really need would be, um, and now connecting to the, the idea of studying at university, um, it's hard to translate, but in Germany, we, we put much effort in not to say it's employability does not mean a job training at university, but something like job enabling. So it would be to provide you with creative skills to deal with uncertainty in rapidly changing environments. So that would be the, the core ability you have to, to get from a university study, and it fits perfectly into the digital um, age, please. Well, and one additional point related to that is as students begin to really be mixed up in ages and experience in the US, 
what they used to call the traditional higher ed student, meaning 18 to 21 years old, is now the minority. Most of the students in higher ed in the US are older, they work, as you were describing too, and I think, you know, uh, part of what uh, uh, Professor Ndemo talked about as a barrier in universities is real, which is we really need much more flexible credentials, you know, competency maps that allow us when we come to a university at 32 years old, we've already got a lot of stuff we've learned how to decide and do. We need the university to have a way and, and a willingness to look at some set of competencies that we have and say, oh yeah, you don't need this, you don't need that, but you do need this, so now let's focus on that and get it done. But that notion of a more uh, open higher ed environment may be a part of unlocking this lifelong learning and frankly unlocking opportunities for higher education uh, providers as well. There might, be an, there might be a nice observation concerning the MOOCs. As the MOOCs came up with, with great interest, there was some thinking it would replace university education. Uh, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen for, for several reasons. What I'm referring to mainly is the MOOCs in the way they are, they are used is, has been changing a lot. Right now we have so-called nano MOOCs in the States. What is a nano MOOC? A nano MOOC is a short MOOC where you have certain time to learn something very special and in this case it's even guaranteed you get a job if you, if you pass the MOOC final. If you do not get a job, you get some money back. So what's going on? The more general view on making use for more general education of MOOCs changed to adopting a certain training, a kind of training for the ever-changing demands coming from industry. And sometimes I was thinking as uh, Mr. Gaul was talking about the different jobs, sometimes it's not a different job, just the job is changing and the demands on the job is changing in a way that you have to adopt Good point. to it and to learn something new just to be in this way. But the, but the observation with the MOOCs is a quite interesting thing to see how this is reacting to a changing demand on new learning. Thank you. Are there other questions? Okay. Uh, I, I, I sort of want to disagree that the MOOCs have disappeared. It's just like when we had Alta Visita and then Google came, and actually Google took over because they solved some of the problems. I have been testing my students. You, if you give them a seven minute clip, all of them would say they watched or they read it. But if you give one hour clip, nobody watches. So I think MOOCs have not focused on what the customer needs. The day that happens, then there will be a problem. I, I hope we come back here to check. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the universities, they do have to change because we know, as, as you mentioned, knowledge is changing rapidly. When I studied, I thought, okay, I've done for my lifetime. I got my PhD, I got a job, and that's it. I have four daughters, and they go on learning, learning, learning. This will be the future, and the universities do have to adapt to that. They don't do it at the moment, frankly speaking, and I'm a bit worried about it, because if the universities will not do it, the companies will do it, because it's a big income earner in yeah, the end. Absolutely. So, and, and this only will work because people are still working if it's done uh, on a virtual base, at least partly. Yeah, so I think this will be the future that we have to go back to university from time to time just to re, what we have to learn at the beginning is how to manage uh, new knowledge. Yeah, how to find it and how to do the best, how to get the best out of it. And then we might have to go back to universities from time to time just to recharge our intellectual batteries. Thank you. Are there, yes, that's true. Further questions, remarks, comments? If not, then I would um, highlight another question which is um, introduced here via our pigeonhole platform. Um, 
open educational, uh, open educational content, open educational resources. The German Rectors Conference has voted um, very much in favor of the open educational resources in February 2016. And um, my question to the panelists would be, um, my general feeling is that there were quite high hopes um, connected to it, but it, I mean, it turned out not to be, let's say, the, the solution for everything. Is, is that the right impression, or am I, am I wrong? I, I actually think it is transforming education. It's just, as someone else said, not exactly the way we thought. Uh, you know, when the MOOC, uh, MOOCs began to come out, there was high hopes that somehow that would just solve learning. But as, as, uh, as Dr. Hess said, if you think about how learning actually works, you've got to have practice and feedback. You can't just sit passively. So those resources really from the beginning could never have solved the education problem. But what's happening I think now, which is much better, is some combination of you know, uh, blended uh, faculty who are working with a variety of education resources and the students to create these practice and feedback environments. And honestly, many of the open educational resources are just as good or just as not good as many of the very expensive published resources. And so you might as well be wrapping a great feedback and practice environment around some well-designed free educational resources rather than paying for them unless there's some real advantage to what's being paid for. And I think that's already happening now. A number of universities and schools in the US are freeing up cash from buying textbooks that they're now investing in different kinds of technologies that then help them do great blended and personalized versions using opening education resources. So I, I, it's complicated, but I think there is some real advantage there. Uh, maybe one could add that to a certain degree, the available educational content is not used as much as it was expected. So it's disappointing to the degree it is used. And actually, maybe we, we should know or reason a little bit more about it, but we would probably need an anthropological view, as we heard just before, why it is not used. I liked it a lot to see a little bit the mental models behind not doing, not uh, following, not inventing, and something like this. They didn't answer the question about the educational uh, open content, but there could be interesting answers. And there are barriers which are hidden or sometimes open, but it, the potential is great. The use is quite small. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful dialectics. Yes, the African question. I'm just yeah. saying that the the, the threshold of failure, I think, if it, if it is 5% and 5% across the world, those are millions of people. Um, that's why I would say that it, it's actually doing something. It's just that we, we are not seeing like 50% of the students or 60%. But even if it's 10%, um, especially um, where I come from, which is resource poor, um, open, open access has been a wonderful thing. I mean, students working on it. Thank M you. Maybe one should add, uh, quite often we answer these questions on the Western Europe, North American point of view. And we do not take into account from a cultural perspective how things might be different. And we had just this Global Learning Council meeting during the lunch break, and we talked about paying much more attention to cultural differences. So it's very good that you pointed to that aspect because the, the given potential might be used much, much more under different conditions than we face right now in the Western Europe, North American point of view, how we do a lot of our analysis and our, our points of view. Just a quick comment uh, before Dr. Ruland. Um, there, there might be a coincidence because uh, Professor Ndemo mentioned open access as a topic. I mean, it could be used in a specific sense or in a wider sense, but there, there, this could be, let's say, some kind of meeting point given that we have these big, big, let's call it discussions with the big editors uh, worldwide about the paradigm change in scientific publication at the moment. And so, um, well, it will continue to go on for maybe 10 years, I don't know. Dr. Ruland. I think in Germany and might be United States, 
it's a bit different, I would say, because you have, you have very expensive fees, at least at the good universities. In Germany, we have so many universities, you know. There's an oversupply, and nearly everybody can find a place. So why should the universities and the students, and apart from that, we are a bit conservative in Germany anyway, I would say, so why should they change higher education without a real need, at least at the moment? Yeah, good, good point. Um, I would, I would um, raise another question um, which connects to Professor Ndemo, um, which I find um, an important one. What can non-African countries learn from African countries about digital transformation of higher education, especially role of mobile devices? Actually, we, we are created out of mobile, and uh, there is much to learn from Africa because um, everything is actually on mobile. And uh, especially like in Kenya, where we wanted to put the entire government on the mobile platform. And uh, it is working that uh, even the poor citizens in the rural area is actually using mobile to be able to access government services. Um, what this has done is that it has expanded inclusivity that in a way it would never have been done. If you look at the financial services, uh, less than 10% of the people had bank accounts in Kenya. Today you have 95% because they are able to run the accounts using the mobile and it's much, much cheaper. And you're beginning to see even Western companies trying to learn uh, from this. If you look at uh, um, Uber, for example, uh, initially uh, people fought Uber, Uber was forced to, to find partnerships and provide um, credit to some of the drivers who have a better rating and provided the money to buy the taxis. Um, this is inclusivity, that, that it, those people, no bank would never have given them loans to buy the vehicles. So the mobile has transformed Africa's ICT sector, and uh, hopefully you would begin to see that being adopted in most parts of the world. I can go on and on on several areas, but I want to leave you with um, inclusivity, which has been very elusive um, with several programs, is being dealt with using the mobile platform. And may I add a question to you? Because I like this question a lot. Could be one reason for certain things you're doing coming up at, in, in, in your countries uh, are easier to be done or more successful as here because you have to find against the old forms, old metaphors. There is no model from before. You just start from the possibilities which are in the information environment, in the technology, and you see the benefit of it. And we quite often have to change the concept first. And concept, change of concept is a hard thing for humans. And so you profit from, we, you, we quite often talk about the leapfrogging. Uh, you, you just step ahead without taking care of all the things in between because there's not so much in between. Um, if, if, even in higher education, um, if you come to my class, uh, three quarters are having their, their uh, smartphones and going through notes and it wouldn't have happened if we said go buy laptops and come here and, and stuff. We are seeing leapfrogging and then what you are going to see are new innovations that the Western world would never have thought about uh, because that problem is not prevalent here. Um, and that's why I'm saying there is so much you are going to, to learn from us jumping through the desktops to, to laptops to mobile. Um, and then you're going to see a lot of these handsets um, becoming full computers. You just showed us a tiny thing. Um, so this is, what is uh, where the disruptions would come from in the next few, few, few years or if it hasn't started. Mm. This is quite impressive. Just, just to, to give you 
a very funny story. Many of you might be familiar with um, the, the big platform for study courses in Germany called uh, the Hochschulkompass, University Compass, where you can find all the 18,000 study courses offered by German uh, universities. And um, um, we, we relaunched it a few weeks ago, and now um, it is optimized for, for, um, for mobile devices now. 2017, we have already 40% uh, of, um, of, um, of, of um, what's the word, um, of, um, of users, let's sense, users uh, who are, for a while, who use the Hochschule Kompass, the University Kompass, from mobile devices, but it took a while, took some resources and took some time to optimize it. Now it's done, but you see that the paradigm has not been into mobile for a long, long time. We have to change it now. So, okay. Are there, oh yeah, there's a question, again. You, you, are, you still have the microphone, or shall we throw one at you? Thanks. Um, while we were talking about uh, the African perspective, um, my question is, when we look at education from the European perspective, we have very much the individual um, resources uh, attached to an individual person. Um, and now the digital, digital di um, concept is just attached to persons, uh, enhancing their abilities. But I, what I see, and that's my question from Africa, is that this is much more cooperative, so that you work together, uh, use your mobile devices to learn from each other, and, and rather use a collective approach in, in order to achieve something as society, as a learning outcome. That's, I wanted my friend with the NASA to help me. Uh, one whom buys a smartphone, and uh, you see the mother saying, use this and give it to this and give it to that. Um, I, uh, and that's how we have been able to ramp up the numbers. I don't know whether you have anything to say about uh, Co cooperative use of the gadgets uh, in terms of content you utilize. Yeah. Ah, wonderful. Thanks. Uh, so I'm speaking about the use uh, in a K-12 situation, not a higher education situation, um, of uh, mobile devices by very large uh, rural populations led by children. And we do see two very important aspects of collaboration, to pick up on your idea. Um, first is that um, devices themselves are always shared, so um, brothers or sisters or friends will usually use the same advice to come in and will tend to study collaboratively. That's a, um, a, you know, a key use case. The other is that the device access, um, in the case of uh, secondary and primary education, is obviously mediated by the parent. Um, and that means a lot of the messaging has to be around uh, why technology is good for your child. Um, this clearly wouldn't be the case in higher education. But yes, uh, comparing the uses I see in a sub-Saharan African setting with those I see from other work in a European setting, um, it is indeed a paradigm of much greater collaboration and sharing um, uh, through technology of the learning experience. And the use case that we might think of as normal, I sit down with my screen and I study by myself, is actually quite rare in, um, in ethnographic terms in sub-Saharan African use of uh, learning technology. Thank you very much. It, it leads maybe to the, the last question for, for this afternoon, which I found in its, let's say, in its, um, in its simple majesty, I found quite impressive. <laughs> Should there be a centralized curriculum for the whole world? Let's, let's call it the, the overall collective approach, Dr. Rüland. No, it would be deadly boring. Forget about it. <laughs> Bro. Uh, should I say yes because you said no? Would that be helpful? No. I, uh, no, I, I mean, it can't be. H however, there, there is an interesting point here, which is for certain very hard and important skills, we really should aggregate our efforts around the globe. But, you know, things break apart because of context and culture and different job needs and all of that. 
But there are some very hard things, whether it's about writing or reading for meaning or uh, something about, um, you know, in the mathematics, things like that. There could be some reasons to really get a worldwide push to, you know, have the same performance uh, items and then to, you know, understand how do we make this work better and then make that really available to unlock a lot more potential. But not the whole thing. I can't see that. Who did you ask this question? <laughs> Just a second, um, our panelists, or, or, or directly, a direct comment? Okay. Please use the microphone. Because uh, that's a very important issue. I think we should have a whole world course on the Paris Agreement. Yes, the Paris Climate Agreement. Yes, I mean it. And every country should have its addition to how they will address those challenges. It's a huge, huge challenge. And the whole course for the whole world would be a perfect thing to do. And it's not going to be done in a minute or two. It would take years. But at least we would have something we could hold on to. Thanks. Please. Uh, actually, already we have a, a, a standard uh, curriculum in mathematics, because you hear about Khan Academy from the dingy places to places like Berlin and the U US. We, we already have something standardized. And, and you are beginning to see. It is just that the disruptions haven't come at the right time, but you are going, you are going to see that happen. I mean, people are going to delve deep, deeper into this, and you find there's something standardized across. One good thing about a centralized curriculum in terms of a reservoir of different units you can pick up or combine in a different way. So. It's not easy to say no, uh, because there are some goods depending on the way you are making use of it and how, how you adapt it, how you select it, how you rearrange it. So it's an interesting question from my point of view. Thank you very much. Um, this could be a very nice final word. Thank you. We are already 10 minutes over time, but I think that's fine. Um, I would like to say thank you to the panelists for this skillful, subtle, and entertaining discussion. Thanks a lot. And all the same to the audience. Um, just the short remark, the quote I had from music is from the record Home by Spearhead. Check it out. It's really dope. So um, take this as a home, take home message. Thanks a lot for your interest and thanks for the panelists again and thanks to the organizers. Thank you.